welcome back to Grocket OG TV GMAT edition, where we're going through the official guide to the test, the 12th edition, like it says at the bottom of your screen. We're going cover to cover, question by question. My name's Jim Jacobson. We are in the ongoing process of going through the quantitative section now. We're in the problem solving sample questions. And right now, we are on page 155 in your book because of course you have a copy of the book in front of you, uh, and we're on question number 21. That's where we left off last time. Okay, so, oh, wait, just get the answers in there. All right. So running at the same constant rate, six identical machines can produce a total of 270 bottles per minute. At this rate, how many bottles could 10 such machines produce in four minutes? So the keys to this question, first off, we have to realize, or we have to notice, really, that the, that the machines in question are identical. This makes a difference because it means we don't have to use anything like the work formula, which forces us to compute different rates for different machines. It means we can divide this rate that they have, this 270 bottles uh, per minute with these six machines working at a constant rate. We can simply divide this rate evenly by six to figure out the rate per machine. So if the machine is producing 270 uh, bottles per minute, we can divide that by six. 270 divided by 6 equals 45 uh, bottles per minute per machine. But of course the question isn't asking us for the bottles per minute per machine, and nor did they give us that in, among the answer choice th uh, choices, thank goodness. So no uh, evil or um, tricky trick answers, trap answers like that. We need to figure out how many bottles 10 machines at this rate could produce in four minutes. So we actually have to increase uh, the total number. Um, this number needs to go up because we are increasing both the minutes and the machines. So this is, uh, you know, 45 bottles in one minute with one machine. We need to figure out what it's going to be over the course of four minutes with 10 machines. So really the multiplication problem stays the same except we're going in the other direction. 10 times 4 times that rate of 45 equals, so 10 times, let's do the easier one first, 10 times 450 um, is, uh, or sorry, 45 times 10 is 450 um, and that number times 4 is 1800. So there are 1,800 bottles produced by 10 machines of this kind in four minutes. That leads us to answer choice B. Do note uh, that this one at least has the some of the right numbers in there. I guess they're assuming that you'll do the math wrong. It doesn't quite rise to the level of a super tricky trap, but uh, if you're if you're being careless with your numbers, this is the sort of thing that might jump out at you. Uh, However, of course, since we are careful test takers, it did not catch us. Okay, we shall move on then to question number 22. As soon as I'm able to erase the evidence of question number 21. All right, number 22. So, um, right, let's get these down. <laughs> well, I'll write them down anyway. I realize that's not that funny, but I guess you take the humor where you can get it on the GMAT. So, of the five coordinates associated with points A, B, C, D, and E on the number line above, which has the greatest absolute value? And so then we have a number line, which I shall attempt to draw relatively straight. I guess I could have used the drawing tools for that. So we have 0 in the middle, 1, 2, negative 1, negative 2. So then we have one here, one about there, There. I, 
guess this is a lot of setup for a question that obviously on the real GMAT you wouldn't need to redraw the diagram for your own purposes. So in this particular case, this one's really just testing your, your understanding of the nature of absolute value. Absolute value is literally um, the distance of a number from zero on the number line. And it doesn't matter which direction it's in, we just need to treat zero as the origin. How far is the number in question from zero? So the number with the least, the lowest absolute value is C, because it has no distance from zero. Totally can't be that. Um, and so then we're, we're just looking for the things that are furthest. The only contenders then are choices A and E. Um, choice A is at negative 2, which is a distance of 2 from 0. Choice E is just short of 2 on the other side, so it is uh, slightly less than an a the absolute value is slightly less than 2. So the number that is the furthest, or the coordinate that is the furthest from 0, has the highest absolute value, that is choice A. I guess I could have circled them both, but anyway. Choice A is our correct one. Um, this one, if you got it on, on the GMAT, you should get very quickly. Absolute value is absolutely critical to success and getting a good score on the test. Let's see, 23. One, two, three, five. So, if n is a prime number greater than 3, what is the remainder when n squared is divided by 12? Um, this one, I, I think it's just easy. It's just to pick a number. We need a number prime number greater than 3. The next prime number greater than 3 is 5. Remember, prime numbers have only two, two factors. Prime numbers have themselves and 1. As factor, as factors. So um, you know, prime numbers are numbers like two, three, five, seven, eleven, etc. Because four has factors of two, has one, two, and four as factors. Six has one, two, three, six as factors. You get the idea. Uh, prime numbers, you absolutely need to know prime numbers on test day, and probably that should be not be the only time you know it. You should know it throughout the rest of your study. So if you're not very familiar with prime numbers, definitely pick up. Uh, some portion, I mean, they're, they're described in the official guide. Um, just make sure you know how to deal with them because they do come up pretty often in number properties questions. Anyway, so it's best to pick uh, the lowest prime number greater than 3 because that makes our math life easier. The lowest prime number greater than 3 is 5. So what is the remainder when n squared is divided by 12? So 5 squared is going to give us 25. Divided by 12, we get you know, 2 times 12 is 24, so we get 2 remainder 1. Now the way the question is worded, they don't tell us that a certain prime number, um, you know, what's the remainder when a certain prime number is divided by 12. The way it's worded, we know that this would be true of any um, prime number greater than 3. If we, if we weren't sure, if we really just weren't confident of our understanding of the question, we could do another one. So 7, <clears throat> 7 squared equals 49. Uh, remember that um, 4 times 12 equals 48, so um, this one would be d divisible by 12 would be 4 remainder 1. So in both cases, we have the remainder of 1. Answer choice B. Uh, and we can see from this question, so every once in a while it's useful to just kind of see how these, sen how these questions are constructed. Uh, the question says, if n is a prime number greater than 3, that part's in there because, of course, if we actually had a prime number less than 3, it would not be divisible by 12. 2 squared is going to give us 4. 3 squared equals 9. Dividing that by 12 would yield no remainder whatsoever. So in order to make the answer true for all prime numbers that you could pick for the question, we had to eliminate these two prime numbers. Otherwise, these two would have been uh, possible correct answers. That's all there is to it. Let's move on. All right. Number 
24. Okay, so we have one divided by the quantity one plus one third minus one divided by the quantity one plus one half. So, so let's actually just get that up here. Um, Supposed to be a one half. Okay, so um, first things we need to do. Almost always, the first thing you're going to want to do is simplify denominators with fractions in them. So uh, to put this in another way, one plus one third is one and a third, also the same as four thirds. So this is one over four thirds minus, and then this one plus one half is the same thing as one and a half, uh, also the same thing as three halves to make them into improper fractions. Okay, so we have two different options depending on which way comes more naturally to you. Um, the most straightforward way is to say, um, well, one over anything is its reciprocal. So the reciprocal of um, one of one over four thirds would be three fourths. And the reciprocal of one over three halves would be two thirds. We still need to get the answer into twelfths, so that would be um, uh, nine twelfths. You know, so we'd have nine twelfths on this side, minus eight twelfths over here, equals one twelfth. Alternately, let's just say that the notion of reciprocal did, did not strike us as immediately obvious. We have the same problem here: one over four thirds minus one over three halves. One of the ways you can always simplify these fractions is to multiply by one in a sense. So if we multiply the numerator and the denominator by the same number times three over three, in this case by two over two, we end up simplifying each of these fractions. The numerator of this one ends up being a three. Um, four thirds times three cancels out that denominator ends up being three-fourths. Same thing happens here. The two goes into the numerator because we're multiplying, and in the denominator, the, the denominators cancel out of these two guys. Um, so we get two-thirds, and then the problem remains the same. Nine-twelfths minus, because we still have to get the uh, least common denominator here. Giving us answer choice D. This guy here, answer choice C, is clearly a trap because it's the same number. This one would basically uh, is the answer we would get if we somehow in the process of all of our calculation here um, came up with two-thirds minus three-fourths. If we somehow reversed the fractions in addition to all the other things we were doing, we would get negative one-twelfth. We didn't, of course, but it could happen on a bad day. So be careful of that sort of thing. Let's see one more on this page. Still page 155, question number 25. Okay, number 25. A lot of similar looking answers, so obviously there's going to be some sort of confusion or potential confusion in this question. Okay, in the figure above, the coordinates of point V are what? So there's not a lot of math on this one, we just have a little picture. So our coordinate plane, slightly crooked, sorry about that. 
Um, looks like we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine units on one direction. And we may as well do the same thing here. Okay. So let's just say two, four, six, eight. Probably I should put them on the same side of the axis, but it's not going to matter for this question. Okay. And then we have this point V here, um, which goes from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. They even draw the lines for us to... like so. And so we need to figure out the coordinates of point V. Um, I suppose I've made it even easier by uh, labeling all axes, uh, but to compute the coordinates you simply figure out the x value, which is 7, <laughs> and we figure out the y value, which is negative 5 down here. It didn't line up exactly, but... So that's choice E. On this one, uh, the other points aren't even I wouldn't even characterize them as reasonably close. Uh, choice A is at negative 7 and 5, so this is A here. Um, B is at negative 5 and 7, so B is there. I guess that's more 8. Well, anyway, you get the idea. Um, C is at uh, 5 and 7, so here's C. Um, and then choice D is at 7 and 5, which is here. So um, of all of the answer choices, only one had a negative y coordinate. So even if we weren't able to figure out anything else about this one, the fact that uh, v is below the x-axis this way means it's going to be a negative number in the for the y coordinate. Only one answer choice had that. We could have just said no, 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 and just picked this one if we were in a hurry and saw that right away. Uh, but that wouldn't have been much of an explanation to you, because what if you didn't see that? You need another way of figuring out the problem. Anyway, moving on. Uh, moving on and turning the page. So... Okay, so page 156, number 26. And then we have 9, 11, 18, 22, and 29. Okay, a rope 40 feet long is cut into two pieces. If one piece is 18 feet longer than the other, what is the length in feet of the shorter piece? So we know that it's going to be 40 total. Um, so we have two pieces of rope. One of them is a short piece. Let's just call our short piece X. And we know that the long piece, we know it's the long piece because it's 18 uh, feet longer than the other one. Um, the long piece is going to be 18 feet longer than X. X plus 18 equals the long piece. And we know that the two of them together originally made up a 40 foot rope. So uh, our short piece plus the long piece will equal 40. We can simplify that expression. Uh, when it's all addition, the parentheses don't really mean anything. So it's 2X plus 18 equals 40. Um, X 2x equals 22x equals 11. So um, <clears throat> we can say, aha, there you are, correct answer. Choice B, the shorter piece is 11. Uh, do note 
the trap here. 29 is the length of the other piece. If we had, for example, said that the long piece, so this is, you know, we didn't do this, but if we had said x equals the long piece, and because it's 18 feet longer than the other one, x minus 18 equals the short piece, doing the same algebra, um, x plus x minus 18, uh, we would have gotten x equals 29. And that's true, uh, but that's not what the question was actually asking. You, we could still have arrived at the correct answer had we done it that way. So it's not that this is wrong, it's more that uh, setting these variables this way increases the likelihood, increases the probability of you're doing it the wrong way. So whenever possible, uh, you know, you'll want to name the variable uh, that you're actually trying to find and then solve for that one. Okay, that's it for number 26. B is the correct answer. You may notice a recurring theme in the trap answers. Um, a lot of times they come from either solving for the wrong variable or uh, answers that you come across partway through the solution to the question. So we're on number 27. Eighty, eighty-two, eighty-four, eighty-six, eighty-eight. All right. A student's average test score on four tests is seventy-eight. What must the what must be the student's score on a fifth test for the student's average score on the five tests to be eighty? Important thing to remember here is the average formula. The average equals the sum of the numbers that you're trying to average together over the number of numbers. Some questions on the GMAT will actually force you to apply the average formula more than once. This is one such problem, so the average formula, if you, uh, if you and the average formula are not good friends, um, you two should get acquainted because you're going to be spending some time together in your studies for the test. So, um, Let's start with the information that we know. <clears throat> we know that the student's average test score on four tests is 78. So just using this average formula, we had the sum of the tests that he or she took. I don't actually find out the sex of the student, not that it matters. Um, the sum of tests over a quantity of four tests gave us an average of 78. From this, of course, we can treat this phrase here, sum of tests, like a variable, uh, and solve for it. So 4 times 78 equals 312. So the sum of the tests that's an F, equals 312. Of course, that's not in the answer choices, because that really wouldn't be realistic. That would jump out to everyone as a wrong answer. So uh, <clears throat> the, the next question is then, what must the student score be on the fifth test? So really, uh, we, we have a new average formula here. We, we have the sum of five tests. This is really the sum of four tests. The sum of five tests, all over five, has to equal 80. But we know what the sum of the first four tests were. So really, we're after 312 plus... Uh, the fifth test, all over 5, to equal 80. Um, so, you know, we have 312 plus the fifth test. Obviously, we could just rename it as a variable, but I want to keep this clear in terms of what's going on. That equals 400. Fifth test, we, we subtract 312 from each side. The fifth test must be 88. Choice E. There's another way to go about this one, uh, which is the way I often think about averages. Um, basically, um, the average is 78 to start with, and we need to go to 80 over five tests. 
So this is over four tests, and we need the average to be 80 over five tests. So there is a two-point difference between uh, where the student is and where the student wants to be. So the student needs to get basically the equivalent of two more um, two more points per test over all five tests to reach the average of 80. So getting 80 on one test won't be enough. There needs to be not only um, you know enough points on on this one to raise the average to 80. There needs to be enough points on the fifth test to make up for all of these not being 80. So uh, 78. 78. Maybe I'm explaining this in more detail than you really need to understand what I'm saying, but I just want to make this clear. So if the student had 78s on all the exams, the student would be uh, short of the average of 80. In order to get the average of 80, we need to add two more to each of these. So that's 5 plus 2s equals plus 10. So the student needs 10 more points than the previous average to get the new average up to 80. Add 10 to 78, we get 88, the answer. So there, there's multiple ways you can go about this one um, using the average formula or using kind of a, a reasoning approach. It amounts to the same thing. Correct answer, 88 on this exam, and the student gets the desired average. Let's see, 28. Sorry, I had so much to erase on this one. I just did so much explaining. Where were we? 28. Oh, goodness. Okay. 7.1 times 10 to the 8th. 5.9 times 10 to the 9th. 1.6 times 10 to the 10th, 1.6 times 10 to the 11th, and 5.9 times 10 to the 11th. So lots of scientific notation here. This will be interesting. Okay, so the average distance between the sun and a certain planet is approximately 2.3 times 10 to the 14 inches. That doesn't seem like it's very far. But anyway, we have to take the problem as it is. So the average distance between the sun and a certain uh, planet is approximately 2.3 times 10 to the 14th inches. Which of the following is closest to the average distance between the sun and the planet in either kilometers or kilometers, depending on where you are from? So one of those is equal to approximately 3.9 times 10 to the 4th inches. Um, so on this one, we can tell from a couple different aspects that there's going to need to be a little bit of estimation involved. Uh, we find, you know, we have the question, which of the following is closest in the question? So that suggests that we aren't looking for the exact computation. Also, we get an approximate uh, comparison between one kilometer or a kilometer and um, that in number of inches. So um, really what we need to do is convert these rates. Um, so we know that uh, the ratio is 1 to 3.9 times 10 to the fourth inches. And we need to figure what that is over a distance of 2.3 times 10 to the 14th inches. So we just multiply that ratio times the number that we had. So we have 2.3 times 10 to the 14th times that ratio um, multiply it all out we get 2.3 times 10 to the 14th inches <laughs> I learned kilometer in case you were wondering which one I learned. Uh, anyway, over 3.9 times 10 to the fourth inches. 
So remember, when you divide exponents uh, by exponents, you are um, subtracting them. It's only when you raise exponents to exponents that you multiply or divide. So 10 to the 14th minus 10 to the 4th is going to leave us with 10 to the 10th. So we're going to have 2.3. Three point nine times ten to the tenth. That's not in any of the answer choices, though. Everything is expressed as um, a whole number. Well, not a whole number. A a decimal. No fractions um, in scientific notation. Also note that nothing looks exactly like what we're after here. We do have some things that end in ten to the tenth, but everything is within one or two of that. So it's a little bit early to tell what's going on here. Um, the one thing we do know is that the fraction here, 2.3 over 3.9, the numerator is smaller than the denominator. So what that means for us is that whatever this number is, it's going to be uh, less than 1. Okay. So if it's going to be less than 1, all of the answer choices are greater than 1, which means we're, we are going to have to take one of the... Um, decimal places basically out of the scientific notation and put it into whatever this number ends up being uh, in order to get a number before the decimal point. I don't know if that makes sense. If we were to divide uh, 2.3 by um, 3.9, um, basically it ends up being well, I'll just tell you, it ends up being 0.5 something, which actually points immediately to these two answers. But in order to make it not 0.5, but five point something we need to have it as, instead of times 10 to the 10th it needs to be times 10 to the 9th so this is this answer looks like this might be our answer but let's just double check to make sure um, one thing we can do here is do a little estimation we can say that 2.3 um, so 2.3 is uh, over 3.9 is almost the same as 2.0 over 4.0. Keep in mind that with a slightly larger uh, numerator and a slightly larger or slightly smaller denominator, this will be act this will be slightly larger. Well, this one actually equals um, one half equals 0.5, which was the same number we came up with. So this is approximately 0.5 times 10 to the 10th, or 5.0 times 10 to the 9th. Uh, which gave us the 5.9. And remember, 5.0 it was an approximation. Uh, and whatever number we had, because this was actually the slightly larger numerator and the slightly smaller denominator, that makes the number even larger than our estimate. So it's going to be 5.x. I probably shouldn't have made it x. 5.y uh, times 10 to the 9th. And there's only one number even close to that. So um, either by estimation or some logic, we can clearly arrive at the conclusion that this is the only one that's even close. 5.9 times 10 to the 9th. A lot of work on that one. Okay, we are on to question number 29. Okay. Question 29, and then we have our answers. A is greater than zero. B is greater than zero. A B greater than zero. A minus B greater than zero. And A plus B greater than zero. All right. If the quotient a over b, or a divided by b, is positive, which of the following must be true? So a divided by b is greater than 0, that, that being the definition of being positive. So in order for a over b to be positive, we either need to be, uh, we either need a, b, both positive or both negative. 
because uh, if one of them were positive and one of them were negative, the end result would be a negative number rather than a positive number. Also, in order for this quotient to be greater than zero, we also need um, both of them to not be zero. We certainly can't have b as zero because then we'd be dividing by zero and that's naughty. Um, also, we can't have a as zero because then we could no longer have it be greater than zero. It would be equal. So, um, which of the following must be true? Must it be true that a is greater than zero? Um, no, because really it matters what both a and b are doing. So it could be that a is greater than zero, but that alone need not be true. If both a and b are negative, um, it also works. So choice a, not the answer. Uh, choice b, it works the same way. Uh, a and B both need to be accounted for, so um, B being positive on its own is not enough to guarantee that um, A over B is greater than zero as the question demands. Choice C, A times B is greater than zero. Let's think about this one for a moment. Um, if A and B are both positive, uh, again, which is a requirement of a divided by b being greater than zero. If they're both positive, a times b would also be positive. If a and b are both negative, remember a negative times a negative is a positive. So uh, this actually would need to be true. It's actually the same, more or less the same problem. Um, a time, In order for a times b to be greater than zero, they need to be both positive or both negative. The same thing that's true of our stated issue here. And these other ones where we're subtracting a from b uh, and or adding a to b, and uh, neither of these need to be true. We don't know anything about the relative sizes of a and b. We really only need to care about their signs. So both of these totally wrong. Choice C, a times b is greater than zero, is the only possible correct answer. I suppose, strictly speaking, that's true on every quantitative question ever on the GMAT, there should only be one possible correct answer. If you have two possible correct answers, well, let's just say, uh, unfortunately, it's much more likely that you are wrong than that the GMAT is wrong. Okay, so page 156, question number 30. The dots on the graph above indicate the weights and fuel efficiency ratings for 20 cars. How many of the cars weigh more than 2,500 pounds and also get more than 22 miles per gallon? So um, I'm not going to redraw the whole thing because that would take the entire rest of the time. Um, just note that we have the fuel um, on this axis and the weight on this axis. Um, we got a 20 and a 25, and a 30. Um, promised I'm not, I'm not doing the whole thing, and I guarantee you I'm not doing the whole thing, but um, there's a point to this. So, um, in this particular case, then, um, we need the number of cars, so there's 20 cars on the graph, and I'm not going to put them all on there. We need... Um, how many of them weigh more than 2,500 pounds and also get more than 22 miles per gallon? So, and then the weight is in hundreds of pounds. So basically we need them all to be those that weigh more than 2,500 pounds. So we don't need to draw the line here. We need to draw the line, um, it's almost like a dotted line. From this line forward are the cars we are interested in weight-wise. Um, and then we also need the ones that get more than 22 miles per gallon. So again, we aren't using the actual line. We need the, the number more than that. And this one also, we need the number more than that, not including the line itself. And it turns out there actually are not that many cars in that range. Um, we actually only have, let's see, um, it looks something like the dots that look like this are the five that meet the criteria that we're after. Um, and I just gave away the answer. <laughs> it's answer choice B, that there are five cars that are greater than that. 
um, some of these trap answers. Um, choice C is the number of cars that are greater than to, that meet that meet the mileage requirement that are greater than 2,600 pounds. Um, right, and then we have the this is the number that are just the number that are greater than 2,500 pounds. Um, yeah. So basically, they're they're because the units measures on the graph um, do not necessarily coincide with the numbers that we are after in the passage, and the fact that it specifies greater than as opposed to at least those are the types of errors that are typically introduced in these uh, data interpretation questions, where basically you misread the question or misread the graph. Be extra careful when you do this. The other issue that makes this one trickier. Um, this actually should have been a 30, um, is that uh, these axes are similar. And actually, I didn't really account for that when I was looking for trap answers. Um, it would be entirely possible for someone to mistake um, the 22 on, on the one axis for the 25 on the other. So it would be something like here versus here, um, giving some very different numbers. I don't even know if there are any in that category. Anyway. So uh, be very careful with data interpretation. Be very careful on the test in general. It's a good idea. It's mathematically possible to get a good score by being completely careless. But if you really want to get into the school that you're after, being careful is the way to go. All right, number 31. So we have x over y, y over x, x times y, 60x over y, and y over 60x. OK, interesting. How many minutes does it take John to type y words if he types at the rate of x words per minute? So this is basically a rate question. Not even basically. This is totally a rate question. Um, so um, we can just write it out in words what the question is actually asking about. So we want to know how many minutes it takes John to type Y words. So he would produce Y words um, in M minutes. typing at um, x words per minute. So x words per minute is his rate, m minutes is his time, and this is his output. And so for solving, so we're, we're, we're trying to solve for the number of minutes. So if we um, so we can simply divide both sides by his rate, which is his words per minute. So um, y words divided by x words per minute equals his m minutes. On the real GMAT, unless you find yourself likely to be confused by the variables that you've chosen, you probably won't write things out the way that I'm doing here. This is as much for clarity and instruction as, as for any real use. Um, whenever possible, choose descriptive letters for your variables. Uh, so M for minutes is super. Um, w for words might have been even better. Uh, X and Y are often very tempting variables. Uh, the only danger with X is uh, that it can sometimes look like a multiplication sign. Also be careful of 0 and S as, as variables because they can look like 0, or o and, o and S as variables because they can look like 0 and 5. Otherwise though, um, you know, do what you want. I, it is sometimes useful to either write out a key um, in advance or if you want to you can use the same uh, practice of actually writing out, when you're not actually introducing any numbers or many numbers, writing things out in uh, variable form or even you know without the variables, we could have just said minutes in parentheses times words per minute equals words. That would have given us the same answer. Anyway, um, 
And that's all we're doing here when we're looking for the answer. We cross out the words that we use to describe them. His number of minute, minutes is y over x, which is choice B. Ta-da. OK. We'll move on. Question number 32. Mm -hmm. A, B, C, T, E, or square root of 20, 24, 25, or times the square root of 20, plus 8 times the square root of 2. Always be a little bit suspicious when you see um, things show up more than once in the answer choices that suggest that that might be part of the answer. But it may not necessarily be, but just know that. Okay, so then we have this expression um, 16 times 20 plus 8 times 32. And it's one big square root. Now, the thing to remember here is that even though you can say when you have the square root of xy that that equals the square root of x times the square root of y. You cannot do square root of x plus y equals, because it doesn't, does not equal square root of x plus square root of y. So we can't actually separate out um, the two elements of this one um, into separate, separate expressions, separate radical expressions that might be easier to compute. Uh, you can, if you want to, uh, do the multiplication, and I, ugh, I mean, you know, you can. It ends up being, um, you know, 320 plus 256, and then you're left with the square root of 576. If you happen to know what that is off the top of your head, you probably don't even need to be watching me do these problems. Um, you could then start subtracting out perfect squares from that. Um, that would still be not that fun. So another way to approach uh, questions like this this one here is to try and figure out other ways of organizing the information. One of the most useful things is to notice that they have some common factors. They're all even numbers, and in fact, both 16 and 32 are both factors of each other. So, um, and both have four as a factor, which is another perfect square. So what I did on this one is actually just kind of multiply it out uh, divide them up into some uh, some of their lower factors. So 16 times 20 is the same thing as 4 times 4 times 4 times 5. We're adding that to 2 times 4 times, um, well, 2 times 4 times 4. Because it's 8 times 4. All of that is still the square root. You will note that we have three fours in each case. So we can redistribute um, the, the math here. So in this case, to simplify it a little bit, it would be four times four times four times the quantity um, five plus two times two. That may not look better, but it is. <laughs> um, then we can do the math here. 4 times 4 is 16 times 4 is, ouch, 64. So we have 64 times, 2 times 2 is 4, 5 plus 4 is 9. Square root of 64 times 9. Now here we can invoke this rule of exponents down here. And so then this is the same thing as the square root of 64 times the square root of 9. Whoa, why did I write that? <laughs> it's not even a 6 in there. OK, uh, the square root of 64 is, of course, 8. Square root of 9 is 3. Equals That product equals 24, our correct answer. So the initial suspicion that I had about uh, the square root of 20 playing a prominent role in the question turned out to be false. But uh, you can never be too careful, and it is good to notice trends in the answer choices. Um, 
note that 576 is the, the uh, square of 24. Um, if you knew that, like I said, uh, you probably have fast forwarded to the next question already. I hope you did. Anyway, choice B, correct answer. I think we have time for another question. So we'll move on to the next page, number 33. Racing finished. We are on to page 157, number 33. One twelfth, one ninth, one sixth, one fourth, and one third. If O is the center of the circle above, what fraction of the circular region is shaded? So we have a circle. That's a pretty good circle, considering. And that's a pretty awful diameter. Let's go with that. OK. So shading circle O, 50 degrees. OK. O is the center of the circle. What fraction of the circular region is shaded? Two approaches that we can take here. One is to remember that when, that vertical angles, you know, if you have two lines that cross each other, um, these two guys are vertical angles, these two guys are vertical angles, even though they're not vertical, they're congruent. Uh, they have the same angle measure um, as each other. The reason we, we, I guess we don't say that they're equal as opposed to congruent is that these could be line segments and they could be different lengths. But they're congruent, they fit on top of each other, so x would equal x and y would equal y here. So that means that this angle 150, I'm going to put this in another color to show things we're adding later. So this one's also 150. So um, the parts that are not shaded are, let's go back to black, um, 150 plus 150 equals 300. You may remember that um, there are 360 degrees in a circle. So 360 minus the 300 stuff that's not shaded equals 60 um, degrees that are shaded. And the question, of course, is what fraction of the circular region is shaded? So then we say, well, 60 is shaded out of 360 total. That is the same thing as 1 sixth, sixth choice C. The other approach you could have taken is one of complementary angles. Um, so if each of these is a straight line and 150 degrees is what's not shaded, that means that this in here is 30 degrees because 150 plus 30 equals the 180 degrees for the angle of a line, a straight line. Uh, ditto this other one here. This one would also be 30. So there's two sections that are 30 degrees because um, this whole thing is 180, and this is more colors than I've ever used in one of these things before. This whole thing is 180. So the, this is the other way you could have figured it out if this just came to you more naturally. Um, you would still need to remember to go to the, um, to the full circle to get the fraction. In either case, 1 sixth is the answer. Um, now I want to make sure we end on time, um, so I shall pause here permanently. Um, well, permanently until next time. So we finished up with uh, page 157, number 33. Next time we'll start up with number 34 on page 157. My name's Jim Jacobson. You've been watching Grockett's OG TV GMAT edition, where we're going through the 12th edition of the official guide to the test, cover to cover, question by question. And uh, yeah, hope to see you then.